Well, good morning. <clears throat> Special welcome to any first-time guests. We're grateful to have you with us. I wish I could see you, but uh, we are working on the lighting, and we're just glad you're here to worship with us. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 10, we're studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans, and we are in chapter 10. If this is your first Sunday, you've missed just a little bit, three years worth of laboring in Romans, but the glory of the gospel is that you can take it up this morning and just be filled with the glory and beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's pray unto that end that God will meet us as we look at a glorious passage today. Father, we come before you and we are so aware that the only reason is because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. God, we acknowledge that we don't have a little bit of access, but we have full access now to you as beloved children. We are justified in your sight. We're adopted and accepted and loved. Lord, I pray that every heart is full that has called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and been saved. Lord, I pray now that as we continue to worship you in this word, that even this morning our hearts would be full with the large heart of our God. You are a merciful God. We've seen that, that your purpose and glory is to put that mercy on display. That is the reason you've created. And God, we, we see that that heart is large. It's large for the nations. And so we, we pray that every heart in this room would see that there's room for them at the table of their God. And so I pray, let the gospel break into every heart this morning and let the children of God be glad in such a father. So Lord, meet us and bless us in this time in your inspired word for us. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10 let me set the context briefly. We finished chapter 8. Our breath was taken away at the fullness and the beauty of this gospel. It began that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the chapter ended that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And the question from Paul came, well, what about Israel? He'd heard this many times. What about your chosen people most of them at the writing of this um, are in unbelief. They've rejected Jesus Christ. It doesn't seem like nothing can separate you from the love of God. They seem separated. And so our eternal security is at stake in this question that Paul has been working on. And the answer has been profound and even more anchoring and securing of my faith and trust in God as he's been answering this in chapter 9, he gives us the sovereign perspective. Not all Israel is Israel. I will save whom I will save, and I am working in history exactly how I want to unfold this gospel. I'm a sovereign God, and I do as I please. And then he moved into the human responsibility perspective, that Israel tried to do with the law what it was never intended to do, to be a ladder, to climb into heaven, to work out your own righteousness, to get accepted by God. And thus they rejected Jesus Christ who offered them righteousness by faith, the righteousness that he came and gave to that requirement. They rejected the cornerstone that was laid before them. And Paul personified being right with God by law and by faith in verses five through eight. And, he, and then he says this word of faith the gospel, the whole letter of Romans that we've been studying, the one that Paul is not ashamed of, it has come near. And he said, you don't climb to heaven. He came down. Jesus Christ came down to earth. You don't have to go across the sea to Jerusalem now. He's come so near. He's come right into this place. He's come to this earth and he's fulfilled the law and he has died under its consequences he has brought salvation uh, in himself. He has come and done everything necessary for us to be saved. He's accomplished our redemption. And he says it's near. It has come so near, it's come into our hearts and it's come into our mouths. And in verse nine, we saw this, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so it is so near. It's not just a Jewish salvation. 
The arms of God are outstretched to the world, to the nations. It's near, and it's near to anyone on planet Earth. It's for anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just a peculiar people for for himself. It's the nations now being offered to come in to the kingdom of God and salvation. And that is what Paul takes up this morning in verses 11 through 13. Let me read them to you. For the scripture says, (coughs) whoever believes in him will not be disappointed For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is the Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And in these three verses, there's a Greek word, it's called pas. And it's used four times in these three verses. And this word means all, everyone, anyone. That's the the thought. The, The word of faith is near to any who respond to the offer of God's salvation by repenting and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's offered to all, to those who will respond apart from law, apart from cleaning yourself up and trying to make yourself acceptable to God, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And it's a response with the the heart. The heart believes that God raised him from the dead, and the mouth says, Jesus is Lord. He's been raised, and he is the Lord of all. He's the Lord of my life. And they call to Christ, save us. We can't save ourselves. Jesus, save us. I was thinking of blind Bartimaeus. I always called him blind Bart. And Bart said, son of David, have mercy upon me. What do you want? Open my eyes. I want to see Jesus. No one ever cried to Jesus for mercy by faith, but did not receive mercy. And now he offers himself to all who will call. And so I just, the gospel is so near. It's so near that it's present this morning. Christ is here with extended arms, ready to save all who will call upon him for salvation. Whether you're sin-filled, broken, Nobody's in this world, moralists, deep addictions, idol worshipers, rich or poor, white collar, blue collar, accomplished or or right off the street, successful in the world's view or unsuccessful in the world's view. I just want you to hear this is so powerful this morning. It is near to you, my friend. God is saying it's near to all who will call upon the Lord. I want to pray one more time. Father, I pray this gospel is so near. And I pray let no one walk out of here under your condemnation and wrath. There is a Christ who is able to save to the uttermost. Oh God, I pray that all in this room will have called upon Christ as a Savior. Lord, meet us in power. If that needs to be two people, God, do your work. And if that's 200 people sitting here this morning, oh God, do your work. Let no one walk out without this near salvation that has come near from heaven to earth and accomplished it. God bless us in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our outline this morning in verse 11, Paul's just going to take this whole thought now to the Old Testament to show that this is the way God has always planned it. It's not new. And he'll start by quoting a scripture in verse 11. <clears throat> in verse 12, he's going to comment on it and take it a little further. And then in verse 13, he's going to grab another Old Testament scripture and capstone the whole argument. So journey with me in verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. This is a quote from Isaiah 28, 16. It's a, a messianic prophecy. Let me just read it straight out of Isaiah to hear it one more time. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Yahweh, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed, Jesus Christ. And he who believes in it will not be disappointed. 700 years before he lays the stone, he say, God's saying, this is what I'm going to do. Paul quotes it in Romans 9.33 as well. Just as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion this stone. 
And so you just got kind of sandwiched in in verse 33, and, and now in verse 11, this, this idea of you know, the one who believes is not going to be disappointed. The stone that has been laid, that has come to this earth and brought salvation, the one who believes in it will in no way ever be disappointed. What you do with Jesus Christ then is everything as you sit here this morning. This is kind of the dividing line of humanity when he separates the sheep from the goats. What you do with Jesus Christ, is he the end of the law in verse 4 for your righteousness? Are you done trying to be moral and clean yourself up and come to church to get right with God? This is the end. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? He's done it all and he's fulfilled it and he's offering a free gospel to you. They're the one who will believe and call upon him to save you as you sit here this morning. The context of that quote was a stone that had been tried. It had been tried and it was a precious stone. And that stone was rejected by men, but precious in the sight of God. So mankind looked and said, I see no value in it. They crucified it. They didn't care about it. But God says, that stone is precious. That's the son of God. That's perfection. I raised him from the dead because he accomplished salvation. This Christ is precious. And this stone God will lay in Zion. This is the prophecy of Jesus Christ. And in that day, that cornerstone was the the key to the whole building. We went over it in 1 Peter 2. But everything that when they built rested upon that stone. It was measured from that stone. It found its balance and everything. The whole building was built upon that stone and the the building that God is building now with living stones from Jew and Gentiles who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ are built upon the foundation stone of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has purchased our salvation. This prophecy stone has been laid At the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son into the world and he lived that life and he was crucified on the cross. That stone has been laid. And this morning he's saying, everyone who will call upon the name of this stone will be saved and built into this temple. The stone was tried and tested. It was tempted in all points, yet without sin. In Romans 6.23, the wages of sin was death. He stood in the furnace, as Greg said, of God's full wrath, and he bore it. And he was buried, and three days later, he was raised, and he came forth, and God said, approved. This stone has been approved by God. And now we are called to believe in him or to believe upon him. So this tried, precious, infallible stone of God, we're to rest upon to put our faith in him alone for our salvation. This is bigger than mental assent we saw last week. It's bigger than saying it with your lips. It's bigger than tattooing it on your arm. It's resting in Jesus Christ that he alone has accomplished salvation in your heart and confessing that he's the Lord of my life. Assenting words unless it's the heart and springing forth from the heart It is not salvation. So the one who sees the value in this precious stone that's been rejected by men, men look at it and see no value even this day. But Paul says we count all things lost compared to the surpassing value, the value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord from whom I suffer the loss of all things and count it but rubbish that I might gain Christ. He is a value to the Christian. And I count everything else loss compared to this cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the one who believes on him will not be disappointed. I believe with all my heart, everyone, and we're going to draw a last breath unless Jesus returns. And you're going to stand in the presence of God, the glory that no man could see and live, a holiness that is blazing And I'm going to be brought into that presence, clothed in Christ, washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to be brought in such a way that instead of being consumed, I'm going to be able to delight in Him for all of eternity because of the work of the cornerstone. 
I will not be disappointed. I won't be disappointed that I lost my life for him, that I fell upon him and believed upon him. If you can feel disappointment in heaven, I don't know if you can, it would be, why did I let so many other things cloud this? Why did I let other things take precedence over this? Why did I worry about so many other things? You will not be disappointed. On the other hand, this word, you know what the word literally means is shamed. You will not be shamed. It's an archaic word in our society anymore. Very few people are ashamed of anything. We, we've taught how to just harden our conscience, sear them, and no one's ashamed. They're not ashamed of their bodies. They just want to show. Hey, there's just no shame anymore in America. Shame implies guilt from wrongdoing, and we've been taught, don't feel guilt, don't feel shame, and Paul spent three chapters in Romans saying, you're guilty, feel shame for what you've done to God, and transgressed Him, and rebelled against Him. We have no wrongdoing, no guilt, no shame, just pop psychology magazines and counseling magazines, you know what, they, they don't write on this anymore. In fact, to, to get a little study on shame this week, I had to go to the Oxford English Dictionary. And then there's pages of definition for shame, supported by scores of quotations. You know, the last quotation was in 1896. <clears throat> Not a popular word. The Bible uses shame or a shame close to 200 times. James Montgomery Boyce in his commentary did a little work on this word. He said that the word meant disappointment, being let down by someone or something in which we believed. And in Romans 5.5, 5, he says this hope will not disappoint. And so this, you'll never be disappointed on the last day by hoping in Jesus Christ. Secondly, he said it meant to be confounded. It meant to be left speechless. Ezekiel 16.63, in order that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation. When I have forgiven you all that you have done, the Lord God declares. The unbeliever always explains away his sin and his guilt, and he blames someone else. I see this on a daily basis. Always blaming someone else for your sin. And at judgment day, he says, you're going to be utterly speechless. You're going to be silent. You're going to be ashamed. You're going to be disgraced. No more pointing and blaming fingers except the child of God will just be accepted and he'll have to give no defense because Jesus has already done. The third word meant exposure, exposure of our sin in God's presence. Genesis 2.25, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They sinned and now they're ashamed and they're making fig leaves and they're trying to hide from God. How much more in the last day when you stand before this God? And Luke 23, 30, then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and the hills cover us. So great will be the dread at this ultimate exposure. But the one who believes in Christ will not, not have to fear this, will not have that moment. And it means disgrace or extreme humiliation. Daniel 12, 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. It will be an eternal shame for the one who rejected the cornerstone. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, said this, it will be a sorry business if we've been trusting in our own good temper, our own charity, our patriotism, our courage, our honesty, when we come to die, we shall be made to feel that these cannot satisfy the claims of divine justice or give us a passport to the eternal skies. How sad to see robes turn to rags and comeliness into corruption. How wretched to regard oneself as covered with a garment fit for Christ's great wedding feast and then to wake out of a dream and find oneself naked. You'll never have this vexation of spirit if you take Christ Jesus to be your confidence by faith. So far from being ashamed on that last day, 
You will boast in the crucified Savior and say, yeah. You will vow with Paul, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Christ alone. The one who believes in this Christ will never be disappointed or shamed on the last day. What a glorious gospel. And those who are shameless now will be overcome by shame at judgment and will enter into eternal shame and punishment forever. Christians are shamed now and mocked, but we won't be then. We will not be disappointed at the end. Look with me in verse 12 for our second point. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. <clears throat> if you will remember back to Romans chapter 3, Paul said there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. All are under the dominion of sin. And so he spent all that time showing you that the, the Jew who had the law and boasted in their morality and taught people the law, they were still under condemnation. And the Gentiles suppressing and applauding each other's sin were under condemnation. So Jew or Gentile, you're equally under sin and under condemnation. And now he's saying there's no distinction then in receiving mercy. It comes from the same Lord. It comes from the same full Christ, the same work. The Lord of Lords is rich and he's endowed with salvation to everyone who will call. There's, there's just no distinction when anyone, no matter what kind of sinner you are, a, a religious one or a immoral one, you call upon this one and this Christ saves. I love that word. He's abounding in riches. It's just overflowing. We could spend the rest of our time in this phrase for 2022. He is a treasure. He is rich in his person and rich in his deity. He lacks no resources to save any who call upon him. All the fullness of deity dwells in him. He has infinite power and grace and mercy. He has an infinite help. He's eternally rich. It cannot be depleted. When, when one calls upon him to be saved, he's just as full as he was before. He's not empty of anything that your soul needs. He is rich in compassion. He's rich in wisdom and patience. Christ in his poverty while he was here on earth was rich. He was rich in his death. Oh, was he rich in his death. His rich blood can make the foulest clean. His rich righteousness can make you stand in God's presence perfectly accepted. He's rich in love. We saw in Romans 8, he's rich in the spirit. He's rich as he breathes his last breath on Calvary's tree, accomplishing salvation. He was rich to pay the eternal ransom price for our soul's redemption. He is rich in glory. He is rich in rule in his lordship. And he's rich to give himself to all who will call upon his name to be saved. In Christ, you are filthy rich. All of his fullness is yours, callers. I look at Soros and what's the Tesla guy's name? Yeah, Musk. Musk. And I think of Gates and all of these people. And I just... Think of their poverty and the riches that I have found in Jesus Christ. I would not want to trade places with any of those men. I have the riches of Jesus Christ, the abounding riches of Christ. We have it all in Christ. What, what do you lack? I can't figure out Christians getting up every day looking at everything they lack. I'm abounding in riches. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I have everything in Jesus Christ, the overflowing, abounding riches. Hallelujah. Yes. Who gets these riches? The one who works, the one who cleans himself up, makes enough good intentions, does penance, makes vows. Who gets these riches? And Paul says it's the callers from a mouthful of faith, believing that God raised Jesus from the dead for your salvation, and I call upon him, son of David, have mercy upon me. 
When we come to Christ empty, poor in spirit, I have nothing to offer, I bring nothing. And I leave with all the fullness of Jesus Christ and salvation. What an exchange. I, I bring nothing but my sin and I leave with all of his riches. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. For out of his fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. Layers and layers of abounding grace. All the fullness of Christ. What a Christ. Paul said, I'm the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Jesus Christ. I, I just feel like a kid in the candy store to preach the riches of Jesus Christ every Sunday. I look at the society and all of this world and we are filthy rich and righteousness in Christ. Why covet the things that perish with moth and rust that destroy when we have Jesus Christ and all of his, we're joint heirs with him. I pray this would break into every heart this morning. And now in verse 13, Paul's going to close out by quoting Joel chapter 2, verse 32. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. There are two things to this prophecy. Peter, Peter quoted this prophecy on the day of Pentecost, and it was about the outpouring of the Spirit on all of mankind, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved in this new covenant advancement. And so the emphasis is put here upon the word call. That is all that we can do. Because guys, we've been laboring for three years that this whole salvation was done in Jesus Christ. And now race doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile. We must come knowing that we have nothing at all to turn God's favor toward us, just away from us. You can't bring your heritage, I'm Baptist, Catholic. You can't bring your baptism, your name, your good works. You can't come and argue your case, I'm a really good guy. Philippians 3, Paul says we put no confidence in the flesh. If you have confidence in your flesh this morning, you're not a Christian. What saves is that we, we have nothing and we call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It shows the realization of, of your need and that you're in trouble and you can't fix it. I like to picture you're just in the middle of the ocean. Think about that infinite ocean. I can't, I can't save myself. Or I'm 10,000 leagues under the sea and I'm out of breath. We have to come to the place. I have nothing to save myself. I call upon the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will save all who call. This is the picture of one who is hopeless in himself and helpless. There's nothing that you can rely upon. Paul says, everything that I used to trust in in my righteousness, I count as manure. It's manure. All I can do is cry out. And this cry is the cry of a pauper who's desperate. And I'm calling upon Jesus Christ to save a sinner. That is all that is demanded of us, to cry out. Luke 18, the Pharisee and the publican, he just cries out, God, be merciful to me, and he goes home justified. That is all that man does in his justification. He calls upon the name of the Lord. I love how Paul put it in 1 Corinthians. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sothenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So the saints, what he calls them, he says, the saints are those who have called upon the Lord Jesus Christ, for salvation. So whoever 
will call. Let not you get in the way. God, I've had people say, God could never love me, Pastor. If you know what I did this morning, you just don't know. Look to the one who's abounding in riches. Anyone, he says, who will call upon this Lord will be saved. Get you out of the way. Quit making excuses. I've made a profession before, Pastor, and I got nowhere. I'm not asking you to make a profession. I'm asking you to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and that he's Lord. Here's my life. God, take it. It's yours. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Call on him. Any excuse you throw up is going to go to the wind. There is a full Savior to be had endowed with salvation. He's full. He just call and it overflows grace upon grace. All eternity depends on what you do with Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with him? What have you done with him? Is he just up on a mantle? Is he just a theology? What is Jesus Christ? What have you done with him? And I pray that everyone in this room is called upon the name of this full Christ for a full salvation this morning. In the quietness of your heart, I pray, call. The application to this message, we have seen this beautiful gospel. <coughs> this morning we have seen that it's a God with outstretched arms to the nations. It's no longer a come and see, come to Jerusalem. It's now go to the nations and tell them. Ambassadors representing Jesus Christ, telling them that he's, he has a full salvation, what he has done to accomplish it, and those who call upon him will be saved. It's, it's ready for the world. It's ready for the nations to go. And so my question, we saw in Romans 9 that God chooses whom he's going to save. And so does he just zap them from heaven? Bzz. With Paul, yeah. <laughs> That's not normal. For me, it kind of felt like it. I just wasn't on a horse. The next verses, I think, could be the most significant in regards to the means that God will use to dispense these eternal riches of salvation for those who call. This is, this is a full salvation. How is God going to give it to the nations? And this is an absolute death blow to hyper-Calvinism. I hate it. It's wrong. It's sinful. Just get over it. Get over that. I, I just sit back and God does everything and I hope everybody gets saved. Stop. That's garbage. Let it die this morning. And come look at what Paul's going to tell us in the Word of God. We have another chain. You remember the chain back in Romans 8, 29? The chain of grace. Those whom he foreknew. He predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. Whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. It's unbreakable. If God sets his love on you in eternity past, you will make it to eternity future. Nothing can break it. Nothing. It's an unbreakable chain. And now Paul brings in another chain. If you'll look in verse 14. How then can they call on the Lord in whom they have not believed? This has got to come from the heart. It's not enough to just say Jesus is Lord. This has got to come from the heart. How are they going to call on whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him, Jesus, whom they have not heard? How are they ever going to believe in him if they haven't heard about who he is and his full salvation and what he's come to earth to do? And how are they ever going to hear without someone telling them, without a preacher, without someone saying, here is what Jesus did? And how are they going to preach this message unless they're sent, unless we go out? There, there's those who are commissioned to take this around the world, but uh, we are commissioned to go tell this gospel anywhere and everywhere. How are they ever going to believe unless God has chosen to use human instruments who preach this gospel, who, who go? And I love what Paul says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Greg Kurtz read the gospel this morning, and I just sat there from my little seat looking at his feet going, his feet are beautiful. <laughs> I've never thought that before. Anyone who goes and brings this beautiful message of a full Christ. If you call on him, you'll be eternally rich and saved. Anyone who goes, your feet are lovely, they're beautiful, because you're bringing the message of eternal life and hope. 
I want everyone in this church to have beautiful feet. Spiritual manicures for everyone right here in Romans 10. Sorry, I'm a little fired up. This is so significant. I talk about it now. I'm going to talk about it now. I'm going to talk about it next week. I'm going to call up one of our pastors to make the application now here at the end of the sermon, and then we'll preach it again. Because this has to be our response to this amazing gospel, and I'm begging you, this can't be the best kept secret of Southside Bible Church. Paul began this letter and said, I'm a debtor to all men. I've received free sovereign grace when I was going to kill Christians, and I'm a debtor to tell everyone, Greeks, barbarians, Scythians, I am in debt to tell people this gospel. And he said, I'm eager to come preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. I'm eager to tell people this message. And some of you are just so comfortable in your doctrine and in your learning and not in laboring and pleading and praying for the lost as this chapter began. God did not save you so you could have a hobby of theology, but for testifying of this amazing grace into a dark and dying world. This is not send missionaries out and write a check so I can spend all my time just reading books and ripping apart those who have little nuances that differ from my perfect theology. You go testify. I just want to theologize. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. I'm calling for an end to not giving a rip about those who are perishing around you and around the world. Just stop. Let this gospel bubble up to where we are unified in proclaiming this message anywhere and everywhere. Riches like this, you just want to share with others. It's amazing that the more who join in your inheritance, the richer you become. The more joy you have in your inheritance. Every time someone joins it, I feel more joy. It's beautiful. You want to share these riches with all people. And as people call, it takes away none of the riches. It is just, we all enjoy the exact same riches. You cannot deplete Christ. So at this point, if you are at home, the live stream is going to turn off just uh, the visual. Okay? Some of you were praying for that since the start of the sermon, but... <laughs> Um, we're going to turn that off. The audio is going to remain so at home you can still hear, but we're going to have one of our pastors now come up, and I want him to make application to what do we do with, with taking this gospel to the nations. So, Pastor, if you'd come join us. Feel free to go off. <laughs> I was thinking through uh, how am I going to bring application to that message? How am I going to help us understand what it is and why it is we're indebted to Christ? And what, what is it that's going on in our heart that we go and we make Jesus Christ known? That we we're, we preach the good news, and I was as I was praying and thinking through this, um, I understood that before we can make application to this passage, so that we might go in obedience to this this beautiful section in Scripture, we have to first make application and apply it to our own hearts. Uh, one must first apply this truth to himself or herself. And for that, I, I have some words from our Lord. Uh, in Mark 2, <clears throat> Jesus heard a Pharisee saying, 
Why does he sit with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. If we don't understand that's what he's done in our heart, how are we going to tell the world? There's another beautiful passage in uh, Luke, uh, Luke 39. Um, sorry, Luke uh, 7, 39. Uh, it's the story of the sinful woman that was forgiven. So Jesus was there again, once again, with the Pharisees. And this woman comes, starts to wipe and kiss and anoint the feet of the Lord. And this prophet, or this Pharisee says, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. He said, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt for both, for both of them. Now, which one of them love, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. And then going down to the bottom, he says, therefore I tell you, verse 47, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little Loves little. <laughs> I, I believe this is the application. I believe it's applicable to ourselves. This good news. And we sing of it. We praise God. I believe understanding this. And how it applies to us. You will not shut your mouths. Even if you're in a closed country. You cannot. I believe that what the Lord is teaching us, like Greg taught today, he is the just and justifier of all sinners, beginning with ourselves. And this is why our feet are beautiful. The Lord, he has set us apart uh, from all other understandings, from all religions, him being the just and justifier, we have this message of grace. No other religion has this message of grace. This God who would come and say to this woman, your sins are forgiven. This grace that comes without any payment because he did it all on that cross that's how this applies to us, and that's the message that we take to the world. This, this is what we are called to be. This is how it applies to us. We are the light of the world. We're a city set on a hill. We're not a light put under a basket, but it's put on a table, on a stand. Uh, this, this, gray, this grace that we've experienced now brings devotion and praise to God. It's the overflow of what's going on in our hearts that we make this Jesus Christ known. It's why we go and preach this good news. We are, we are light bearers in darkness. Just as we have been set free from sin and death, many more will be set free who are in captivity right now. 
Think of that all around you. I know we live in a culture that behaves like they don't want to hear anything and that they're clean and that they're good to their neighbors and that they have no need for God. But we don't know what's really going on in those hearts. And that doesn't even concern us because we have to sing of this God and what he's done in our hearts, in our lives. And so we preach. And so we make his name known because he's the one that wakes us up in the morning, the one that gives us our every breath, the one that gives us peace when we go to sleep at night. He, this is why we go. And then to, to, to the point Pastor Ken made, election is certain. God is sovereign. He's in control to save those that have been foreknown before the foundations of the earth. Predestined. And we're to make this message known because that is the power of that gospel. The power of that work is in the preaching of the saints, the temple of God, making known the mystery of reconciliation. This is what we can't stop singing about. And the, this power comes by from God, third person of the triune God. The, the power of the Holy Spirit will come and he will save just as you and I have been saved. He will save all people. No one is out of his reach. And this is why we're called to preach the good news. That's the why. It, it's, it's for us and for all peoples. He's the God that saves all nations according to his word. Um, Some some more application. Um, Often we tend to think that's what the missionary does. That's what that guy does. Um, And uh, most of the time in our culture, we like to uh, do things large scale. Um, We like to... Uh, organize and start movements of outreach. Uh, We like to set up programs and planned events. And this is how I'm going to be obedient to this call. Uh, And in this way, I'm going to proclaim the good news. I'm going to get involved with this. I'm going to get involved with that. Uh, So these are good things. Praise God. But I've learned uh, that that's not the only way. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not so much how intense we are about organizing and how intentional we are in these moments to go and preach Christ. But I would encourage us to just be consistent in making Jesus Christ known, beginning in our own homes, to our neighbors, to our communities, and if God would call you to the ends of the earth, wherever that might be. It's these small, consistent moments of faith uh, that open doors for the gospel, brothers and sisters. It's the, the, the going about your day and uh, sacrificially welcoming people into your lives, welcoming people into your homes, the parks, Uh, offering a hand, offering to help in whatever way that might be, and all all along doing that uh, to the glory of his name. This is how we bear witness to man. This is how we put good works on display that they might give glory to our God who is in heaven, our Father. And this happens in everyday life, in the grind at work, how you do business, in our marriages, how we parent our children. We do all these things looking to Jesus Christ and that hope, that first love that we experienced. How that gospel message hit us like the woman that had many sins. Like this is good news. And and, and that's what's written on our hearts for the people to hear and to understand. This is the message that we've been given, um, that we might preach this because of the love that we have experienced. 
because of what we believe is true. And that is that Jesus Christ is making peace by the blood of the cross. That's what he's done. That's what he's doing. In each and every one of us. Um, and when it comes to application, I just want us to remember that, walk away thinking that first. How true is this to me? Am I that woman with many sins? Did, did, have I in fact been healed by the phys physician? Hmm? Am I healed? Am I cleansed? And when that's real, you will make him known to those who are sick and hungry and in bondage and lost. You'll make it known to sinners. And it's the love of Jesus Christ put on display through you. So that's your application for this text. That's what, that's what we have in Christ Jesus. And so obey. Obey and live out this life, uh, making his name great, that he might be glorified in our lives. Amen? Amen? Lord Jesus, I thank you, King of kings, Lord of lords. I thank you, God, that you've given us the law, God, that we might see, God, our sins, that we might see, God, the, the wretched man that we all are, God, that we might see the need for a Savior, God, or that it would be that power, God, that opened our eyes that we might see and gave us ears to hear, God, and that that power, God, would be spoken, Lord, to whoever comes in our path, God, that they would see how beautiful our feet are, God, as we are bearers of good news, Lord, to a broken, dark, and perverse, and corrupt generation, God. Please, Lord, save your people, God. Use your people, Lord, according to your word, God. We thank you, Father, that you have sent your Son. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you will never leave us or forsake us. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for being the power, God, the power from on high that makes us bold and courageous, Lord, to all men, to every creature. We pray in your holy name, the name that is above all names. You are our Savior, our Lord, and our God. In your name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.